So I think I'm, we're going to start. Welcome everybody to the um, Cluster Monday Seminar. We're starting a new series uh, this semester and uh, try some new stuff. So I would uh, like to invite the cluster people to stay behind after the, uh, the um, talk. Um, there will be some very short cluster announcements and then there will be a small lunch outside where you have plenty of time and uh, opportunity to interact with each other and most importantly with our today speaker, Mirko Trebastone from the IMT in Luca, whom Stefano will introduce more in detail now. Hi everybody, it's my pleasure to have here Mirko. Uh, he's been a junior professor in Munich, then he mu moved and became associate professor in Southampton, and then uh, he moved uh, in IMT as an associate professor within the unit of uh, SISMA, which is System Modeling and Analysis. He has been my PhD advisor, and uh, he's been also a PI for the project Quantical, which is uh, quantitative uh, measures and systems for uh, um, collective and adaptive behavior. So, thank you. So, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the uh, introduction and also for the invitation to Tanya and Stefano. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, also to start off this seminar series. So, it's a big responsibility also from my side. So, as I said, I'm coming from computer science, but um, as you will see, we are looking into uh, topics that are somehow uh, can be seen as uh, interdisciplinary topics that probably touch on some of the interests that uh, this um, uh, cluster uh, may, may have. And um, because uh, some of the parts that I'm talking about is also, are also related to uh, some collaborations with, that we are having with people from economics and um, psychology, uh, physics, uh, and applied uh, mathematics uh, for the formal analysis of networks. So Stefano introduced me as a PI of a European project, uh, Quantico, which was about uh, the analysis of collective behavior with uh, uh, particular applications to smart, uh, smart cities, smart transportation systems, and, uh, and things like this. Uh, but uh, within that project, uh, we actually also developed uh, um, techniques somehow for the uh, abstraction of uh, complex systems, I would call them complex systems, that can be somehow described as, um, as reaction networks. And uh, I thought that this topic would be relevant somehow for this audience, so that's why I'm talking about this today. Before I start, I would like to ask you um, somehow a little bit about your background. So how many of you are not computer scientists? Wow, okay, good. Like I said that there is some biology, right? Some biologists. And then what other disciplines, more or less? If you can raise your voice just to understand economics, okay? Physics, statistics, good, okay, okay, thank you very much, okay, great. Um, okay, which is actually quite fun because I'm coming from, a, from an institute, uh, uh, Luca, which is a doctoral school uh, that is very interdisciplinary and it's uh, bringing together people from uh, uh, physics, um, engineering, computer science, economics, uh, neuroscience, and psychology. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the disciplines that are somehow of interest also for this, uh, for this seminar. Okay, good. So I will be talking about uh, reaction networks. And uh, before I do so, I will tell you what the reaction networks are, uh, just as a brief introduction. Um, the results here are mathematical results, but I will uh, kind of uh, not uh, discuss them in too much detail. And if you want, we can talk about them later. I would like uh, to show you what our, what our techniques are useful for, mostly. But uh, as we know, there are reaction networks are somehow a basic, uh, fundamental model of interaction among agents that um, can find uh, applications and use in uh, different uh, types of disciplines, uh, including uh, biology, uh, chemistry, uh, computer science, and epidemiology, and so on and so forth. And in fact, one of the main results is showing that uh, essentially any system of differential equations that are one of the most fundamental mathematical objects to, ana to make analysis of dynamical systems can be translated into a reaction network that we are talking about here. So it's got plenty of uses. And uh, uh, here I refer to one paper that is uh, talking about the different applications in several, one of the review paper, one of the many review papers that talks about the many applications of reaction networks in several disciplines. And um, here are some uh, plots of um, a particular 
cases, particular instances on which we are applying our results, which are from systems biology, like gene, gene regulatory networks, but also um, complex networks, and in particular, dynamics on networks. So I will try to introduce how to model dynamics with reaction networks. And I will use uh, one of the simplest, but also most well-studied um, uh, reaction networks in the literature, which is the SIR model. So I will be using this example to show you what we mean and what we do this, with, this type of, uh, with these type of objects. The SIR model is known since the 1927, I think it's the first paper that appeared on this topic, and it's essentially a very simple model of opportunistic interactions between agents, uh, where the state of each agent is modeled according to three local states, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And uh, there are some rules that decide how an agent may change its own state. So the first rule, is saying that uh, there is one agent of species S, of type S, that interacts with another agent of species I, which means a susceptible meets an infected, and as a result of this interaction, the susceptible may become infected. And after some time, an infected on its own, as a spontaneous action, becomes recovered. And that's it. Once you recover, you never get the disease again. So this is a, a pretty much probably all of you know or have heard of this type of interaction. It's been studied in a lot of, it started with epidemiology, but uh, the basic principles of a random opportunistic interaction can be found in many other cases. For example, for basic mechanisms of opinion formation or um, uh, also in computer science for the diffusion of viruses, computer viruses via wireless uh, connectivity, where you have uh, one uh, mobile phone which is infected that uh, gets a Bluetooth protocol exchange with one which is susceptible, and the virus gets passed on over the wireless connection, for example. At the basis of these models are the fact that uh, these agents live in a will-mixed behavior, like a, a chemical vessel, and uh, they interact, and uh, as a result of these interactions, they change state. And they change state according to some speed, which are these kinetic parameters, uh, alpha and beta, which are positive numbers, real numbers, that tell you how fast this can happen, which can be related to the probability with which uh, one interaction happens when two agents of particular types occur. So we call SIR the species. These are the rate. I just call it rate. This is the reaction. And um, once you have a description like this, and you can imagine many types of uh, interactions also based on like age, agent-based modeling and other type of interactions like this, you can give it a meaning. And the meaning can be in terms of some mathematical object that describes the, the evolution over time of the state of those agents. So you have an interpretation which is uh, the a stochastic interpretation. Uh, which is known in the literature as the master equation or the chemical master equation, which is considered, or at least I consider in this case, as the ground truth of uh, uh, a description of a reaction network. Essentially, it tells us the probability of finding the system in a particular configuration, where the configuration is this population vector that tells us at any point in time how many susceptible agents I've got, how many infected agents I've got, and how many recovered agents I've got. And the evolution over time of this triple is determined by a stochastic process, which is a continuous time Markov chain. So continuous time, discrete state space, enumerating all possible configurations that can be derived by applying those rules to some initial condition, to some initial population of our system. So this is a, usually it's a very difficult uh, system to analyze because you have one equation for each state and the number of states is usually exponential with the number of uh, agents that you have. So an exact descri description of that is available only in very limited cases, in special cases. What you do generally is you do simulations, stochastic simulations, and then you try to infer probability distributions out of simulations. Okay? There is another interpretation of that, which is the deterministic system, which is known in many, many different words in the literature. I'm calling here 
the deterministic rate equation, but also, are also called the mean field equations in physics, for example. And the idea is that starting from the very same reaction network, you have instead a deterministic description in terms of a system of generally nonlinear differential equations. So here, I don't want to go into the details of the mathematics of it, but the idea is that here you have one equation for each species. Here you have one equation for each configuration. So usually this system is much smaller than that system. But it is uh, an approximation. And in fact, formally, can be seen as an approximation of the average dynamics of the stochastic process. The idea being is that if you're interested just on the average, you might want to take a look at the deterministic system. If you want to have a full probability distribution type of information, then you need to take a look at the stochastic system. There are things in the middle, like moment closure approximations and other things that I've not covered here, but there is a whole range of different techniques that can vary from a fully stochastic description to a deterministic description via some intermediate hybrid solutions that combine stochasticity and deterministic descriptions. Um, if anything is not clear, please raise your hand, stop me, ask me questions because I like it more. So <clears throat> what is the problem? The problem is that if you want to analyze it, numerical solutions are heavily affected by the number of the, the, the complexity, the underlying complexity of our system. And uh, our idea, what I'm presenting to you today, is um, some ways of automatically simplifying these very complicated descriptions. So even relatively simple dynamics, like the SIR model, which has just two reactions, can become complicated when we imagine that we don't have a um, well-mixed environment, but things are living on networks. Things are interacting depending on where they are, which is essentially what happens in real life. So for example, if we have this uh, very simple star network, so we are modeling a situation where we have five uh, localities, there is, a cent there is a hub and there is the periphery here, we could imagine to write, I'm using text here, code that is actually using the syntax of a tool that will be used for, uh, for, some, uh, for some experiments and as, um, which implements the techniques I'm talking to you about. You can imagine to make an SIS dynamics evolve on this star network. How do we do it? Well, we need to write a lot of rules. So we need to write all the rules with which an infected at each location can become susceptible. And based on the previous description, this is a spontaneous rule. So you can heal the disease on your own without further intervention. So I0 goes to S0, and 0 0.1 is some rate, some concrete number. And then, depend, depending on the interaction here, on the network here, you write all the evolution dynamics based on contacts between neighbors. So I'm saying here that uh, the susceptible here becomes infected because it is infected by one, but it can also be infected by two, four, and three, and vice versa. But there are no rules that uh, make uh, two interact with three because there is no connection here. So the number of rules that you write here is proportional to the number of edges of the network. And for complex uh, real-world networks, they become very large. So this is just some terminology. These we call spontaneous independent events. These are pairwise interactions. And uh, so from biology, we would call this I1 a catalyst because it is an agent that is involved in the reaction because without it, S0 cannot become I0, but it does not change its state. Okay? So what do we want to do? The idea is the following. We consider some original network with lots of interactions with n species and k interactions. And we want to have some kind of a magic wheel that, which is an algorithm, that gives us a reduced network over a hopefully much smaller number of species and a much smaller number of reactions, which somehow has to be, at least for this talk, has to be such that uh, I preserve what I wanted to see in the original network without any loss, any error. And I would like this reduction to, be, to become fully automatic, such that it, can, it is applicable to many, to many systems and not on a particular kind of case-by-case case, um, uh, basis. 
So that's pretty much the idea, okay? And uh, so we developed a unifying approach that somehow can be applicable to both the Markov chain, so the ground truth semantics based on the continuous time Markov chains, and to the differential equation interpretation. What is the implication of that? Well, the implication of that from a computational point of view is that if you reduce it a lot, then, of course, the analysis on a computer, since there are no closed form solutions, becomes much faster. But more importantly, we're interested in the interpretation of the reduction. So we are interested in understanding why we are putting together things, we are aggregating things that were not aggregated in the original network. So can the cluster of variables that will be put together with this mechanism tell us anything about uh, the meaning of the aggregation, the abstraction of this aggregation? So can we infer somehow some overall behavior, collective behavior of the reduced network by disregarding details that are not directly important for observing these dynamics? That's essentially the question. I will try to give you an example of both the computation speed up and the interpretation of the reduction in a number of cases later. Now I will give you a motivational example about what aggregation means in a particular class of models, which is Markov chains. And this is known as Markov chain lumping. It is called uh, also um, coarse graining, in particular in the, in, in the physics community. And uh, some physicist uh, colleagues of mine tell me that it's uh, also related to the renormalization group from statistical physics, whatever that means. What is the idea? The idea is that we have an object. The object is like a Markov chain here. The Markov chain tells us that there are three states which are possible configurations like populations. So here we are observing one element. Here we have two elements and three elements. And there is a speed at which we move, we jump from one state to another state. The speed is at an exponential distribution with some parameter that is k1 and k2. That's the structure of the Markov chain. The meaning of the Markov chain is the master equation, the Kolmogorov equation, that tells us what is the change of rate of the probability of being in each of those states as a function of time. And it is written in this form here. It's a simple derivation from this uh, transition matrix. What we can observe here is that uh, we can write those equations just in terms of pi 1 and pi 2 plus pi 3. Because the sum of these two can be written just it's a minus this object here. So essentially, if we are saying that we can put together 2 and 3 because we can express in a self-consistent way the probability of being the sum of the probabilities of being in those two states, which means that you can define a lumped dynamics over these two macrostates, big pi 1, which is this state, and big pi 2, which is the sum of these two states. So this is a system that in this case just go from dimension 3 to dimension 2, because the, the, the example is trivial, but it's telling us that we have an abstraction of the original system where we exactly preserve the dynamics up to sums of things that are in the original model. But suppose that we are interested in looking at the probability of being in pi 1 here. Well, we can recover the probability from here. We don't care about what is going on here or there because we have exactly the same dynamics afterwards. And that's called Markov chain lumping. It's called um, by simulation computer science, uh, uh, as I said, course graining. But that's, uh, the idea is the following. To rewrite things such that you have a smaller system that you can analyze just as well as far as you are concerned with some observables that you preserve. And uh, the idea here is that uh, you can do that by establishing conditions on this graph. And we like graphs as computer scientists because they are nice, discrete mathematical structures on which we can do a lot of analysis. And the condition on this graph is that the total rates out of states of the same block must be preserved. In this case, there is no total rate out of here. So the, the rate of QT1 is equal to the rate of Q31, Q31, which is zero. That will imply, so a structural equivalence here will imply a dynamical equivalence of that, of that kind. 
So the condition is that any two states uh, have equal rate toward any block. And from that, you can der derive the lamp, the Markov chain. Now, Markov chain lamping has been known at least since the 70s. The first book of Kemeny Snell talked about uh, forward, uh, um, this, this, uh, this kind of lampability. What we want to do here is to somehow develop an, an analogy between this type of aggregation and aggregation for things that are not Markov chains. And in particular, aggregation for things that are like differential equations or other objects that can be seen as the dynamical behavior of complicated reaction networks. Okay? Um, so this is a computer science uh, slide that uh, I am skipping because it's not really important, okay? So there are some, uh, there are some intuitions that are borrowed by, from um, concurrency theory and other stuff, and there is an intuition of how to look at a reaction network as a kind of graph that looks like a Markov chain, but it looks more complicated. But at the end of the day, you can establish some notions that are somehow similar to those of a Markov chain and actually become exactly those of a Markov chain when the reaction network itself is a Markov chain, uh, such that you can do the same things on differential equations and reaction networks with stochastic dynamics. That's pretty much the summary of it, and I've got the papers, and if you're interested, we can talk about it later. So, what is the idea? The idea is the following. Suppose that we have this reaction network. It's a totally arbitrary. Uh, doesn't make any sense. It's just for illustrative purposes. We have four species, and these are the rates of interaction. I should have said that these rates actually induce the well-known law of mass action, where the rate at which a reaction happens is proportional to the mass of the reacting individuals. And I'll give you an example later. So if this is the reaction network, you get the evolution, sorry, the evolution of the Markov chain in terms of this state space. So I tag that as the initial state. The initial state is telling me that there are one copy of S1 and two copies of S4. That's my initial condition. If it is my initial condition, then there are two possible outcomes out of this state because I can apply either this reaction or that reaction. I cannot apply these two reactions because there are zero copies of S2 and zero copies of S3. So these are not enabled in that state. But then, with this reaction, one copy of S1 and one copy of S4 become S2. And with that reaction, they become S3. The rates are different because the rate is this rate times the number of S1 and S4 that are here, two, and this rate here is two times the number of S1 and S4. And it becomes four. I go in this state, in this state there is only one reaction, and then so on and so forth. I complete the state space of the Markov chain. So those are all the possible configurations of my system that are reachable from this initial state. If you've ever done simulations with reaction networks, then you start initial condition and then you let your system run, and eventually it will touch only those states, okay? Together with that, the dynamics is the master equation that tells you how the probability evolves as a function of time, okay? So that's the ground truth. You solve it, you get the full probability distribution. But sometimes, actually in many cases, you cannot solve it. What you observe here, you observe that uh, these two states, in these two states, form a lampable partition block because the total rate out of these two states is the same, three and three, and three and three. So there exists a lamped Markov chain that is aggregating these two states on their own. So you would have this state, this lamp here, this singleton trivial lamp, and this lamp here, and this. But in order to do that, the lamping methods, the classical lamping methods, they require that you first construct the full state space which is exponential in the number of agents that you have in your system. What we are doing is we are detecting this lamping not at this level, but at this level. So we establish condition just on this graph here, on this reaction network, that give us information about this lamping without ever generating that. 
What is the condition? The condition is that we establish species that are somehow equivalent. They cannot be distinguished when you don't want to look into their details. What is somehow the intuition here? The intuition is that uh, what, is, uh, what, are, what is the property that is shared by this aggregation here and this aggregation? Well, essentially it is saying that uh, species S2 is equal to species S3, which is putting them together, but also it is putting this together because the configuration S2 plus S4 is equal to the configuration S3 plus S4 because we are assuming that we cannot distinguish these two species. So the equivalence that we find at this level will tell us that species S2 and S3 are equivalent. Therefore, all the states in which they are, they can be put together. So to give you a little bit of a, a summary here, we have the original Markov chain, uh, the original uh, reaction network, it can be anything. We generate the state space and we get here. We do the lumping at this level, but we won't avoid that because it's uh, too complicated. And then we can merge these two states into a single state and these two states into another single state where I'm just tracking S2 because that's equivalent to S3, so I don't care. I won't avoid that. So I say, okay, I find conditions by some magic that I'm not giving you the, de the, de the, de the details of. I find some condition that tell me S2 is equivalent to S3. Good, so what I do, I create an algorithm that translates this reaction network into another reaction network where one of the two species disappears. In general, for each equivalence class, I take only one representative. And uh, I make the transformation such that uh, when I reduce, when I compute the state space of that, this state space corresponds to this. So I want to go here because I want to be faster and I want to discover equivalences between the states of my objects of interest, like susceptibles, infected and such, but I want to avoid this state, this, this step here, because that's very expensive. It's actually infeasible. In fact, it can be infinite, the Markov chain here. So I don't want to do that. So I go straight here, but I have the guarantee that I get this aggregation. And in fact, I have even more. I have the guarantee that I get the maximal aggregation that I would get without looking at the full details of my system, microscopic details of my system. Okay, so that's the, somehow the, the, the contribution here. So when I look at uh, the same system using differential equations, I have the same, I, 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 I do the same thing. If I take this original system, the rate equations, the, what are called the mass action equations, are one equation for each species, x1, x2, x4. With some negative and plus contributions here that depend on whether they have a, you are a reagent or a product of that reaction. You observe, similarly to the Markov chain case, that actually um, you can rewrite the system by collapsing x2 and x3. So you can rewrite the system in terms of fewer variables, where one variable is the sum of original variables. So it is a special case of a linear projection. It is a linear projection induced by an equivalence over species, more precisely. So if you do that, you can rewrite this system into that system over these y variables, such that the solution of this is equal to the original. The solution of two is equal to the sum of the two solutions, but you cannot invert back, so you cannot get the original from here in general. And the solution of four is exactly x4. But in order to do that, you would need, you would need some uh, magic here that finds these aggregations on your own, which is usually not easy. Uh, in fact, it uh, can be related to one of the most, uh, to the most difficult problems in computer science. So you don't want to do that at this level. But here, you have a graph. So what you do, again, you find some conditions on species. In this case, the same condition, that the species S2 is equal to S3, and you get a reduced reaction network here without ever passing by the rate equations. But again, if you do the rate equations of that, you get exactly those. So we avoid the complicated step of creating lots of equations and then reducing them by passing through the original network first, by establishing relations on the original network that cluster species when they are equivalent 
and they are equivalent because we can preserve the full sums in the original, in the, in the reduced network, okay? Now, the conditions for which species are equivalent depends, are specific to the interpretations, the stochastic and the misinterpretation, but in, at the end of the day, the, the principles are the same and the algorithm for computing them uh, is uh, kind of similar. You just have to plug in the right conditions for checking that the two species are equivalent. I will show you the algorithm without giving you details. Uh, it's important because the algorithm is actually uh, one of the most important algorithms for checking uh, equivalence and uh, minimization of uh, languages, like programming languages in computer science. Um, and it has been adapted to checking equivalences for differential equations and Markov chains. So I'll give you this reaction network, which is essentially a simple binding model. Now, here uh, I have lots of biologists, and I'm no biologist, so apologies in advance. But uh, let me say that this is a realistic model of binding and binding type of scenario, okay? It's actually been, can, be found in many can be found in many papers on uh, computational statistics and biology anyway. But it, just to give you uh, somehow the idea. The idea is the following. You have a protein, like A, with two binding sites. They can be phosphorylated and unphosphorylated. In this example, they become phosphorylated according to a spontaneous reaction, so something that we don't want to model. And uh, with the same rate, the first binding site can become phosphorylated or the second one. Similarly, dephosphorylation happens with another rate, K2, where the first site gets dephosphorylated or the second site does it. But still, the fact is that uh, K2 here is equal to K2 here. And then we have some kind of binding and binding events. So when one site is phosphorylated, you can bind B. And then B can unbind without changing the state for the two binding sites. So this is by construction a very symmetric model because really here, as you can imagine, it doesn't matter the identity of the binding site because they are equivalent, they are symmetric. So definitely there should exist a reduced model that doesn't explicitly track the state of the two binding sites but only counts how many binding sites I have that are phosphorylated, because that's all that matters. And essentially what we can do with those techniques is to find that automatically. How do we do it? The input is this reaction network. The output is the maximal aggregation of that reaction network where you want to isolate some variables that are the observables of your system. So if you want to see what is the fully uh, um, no, in this case, no, but if you want to observe uh, what, is the total, what is the total concentration of this complex where one of the two sites is phosphorylated, that would be the sum of these two variables, this and that. This, you, you put it as an input. The output will be the maximal aggregation that can allow you to recover what you want to observe as an input. So, it is uh, called the partition refinement, the algorithm. And essentially, it goes through a series of steps, starting from the current partition here, where I'm saying, I want to be optimistic. And I'm claiming that all of the species are equivalent. They are all the same set. The algorithm will give you counterexamples that tell you that those, some species cannot be equivalent. When you find those counterexamples, you will split this set in sets that may still be all equivalent between each other. So in this case, I start with the best possible aggregation. Give me a single variable that aggregates the sum of all these things. That single variable does not exist exactly. Because uh, if I test my conditions on all these, I will find that this quantity here, that is the quantity that we use for checking equivalence, will have number minus three, value minus three for APU, and AUP, but AUPB will have number four. So this species here cannot be equivalent to this and that. Still, in this iteration of the algorithm, I st I'm still not sure whether B is equivalent to AUP. But I don't care. I can do a split. I can put these two separately, and then I can leave them in the same block. 
Then I redo the computation, and I do the computation until I checked all the possible candidates, and I cannot split any further. The output of that will be the maximal aggregation. And this is important that you can split without losing any information, because it gives us a, an algorithm that, is a, a, that runs in polynomial time and polynomial space, which means that it can scale to a lot of variables, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of variables and reactions, because it is efficient in the computer science term, it's polynomial time, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> that's pretty much uh, about uh, somehow the theory of it. Let me spend some time about the applications of that. So the applications, what we did, we have a range of uh, kinds of equivalences, and I will give you references later. They are all implemented in a tool, which is this tool, uh, which essentially is a small editor that takes as input either differential equations or reaction networks, and uh, it generates those maximal aggregations according to the algorithms that uh, we have developed. And um, it is connecting to a lot of uh, technologies somehow uh, that uh, talk about uh, dynamical systems and large-scale dynamical systems. So we have Modelica for uh, differential algebraic equations, and MATLAB for uh, MATLAB functions described, uh, that describe the, the vector field of a differential equation, uh, BiomedGen, which is a, a somehow a popular tool for um, rule-based modeling in uh, computational systems biology. And other, and, other, and other repositories, in particular BioModels, which is a repository of computational systems biology models published uh, in peer-reviewed articles, uh, to which we did, we recently presented then a kind of a, an overview of the reduction power of our techniques on those particular models. And uh, I will try to give you the first interpretation of reduction. So what do we reduce in reality? By reality, we mean benchmark models. So if we consider the star network that I talked to you about before, that would be the SIS dynamics, which is like the SIR dynamics, except that uh, an infected becomes susceptible again, which means that there is a steady state in the, a steady state in the underlying Markov chain. So what do we expect here is that there is a symmetry on the graph that gets translated into a symmetry on the dynamics, because the hub is different. But then nodes one, two, three, and four are essentially the same because I've modeled them as having all the same rates independently of the location. So what our algorithm does is that the maximal aggregation of the system is actually this line network, which is essentially considering one block for zero and one block for one, two, three, and four. And automatically you get this reduction this reduced network, which you can interpret. You can interpret as some kind of SIS dynamics on this reduced model. So we reduce the equations and we get some insights into the reduction. And the insight here is quite trivial because it says, well, I am exploiting symmetries that I can find on the graph. But when the graph is very large, you cannot see those symmetries. Here, we can find them automatically. Uh, notice that uh, this interaction is uh, weird because uh, this node is a macro node consisting of four nodes in the original system. So here you have a node which has more than one agent. So in principle you could have interactions within the same node if you think in terms of meta populations. This model here, this reduction, is forbidding those interactions because it only allows infections across this edge. So all the elements that live in this macro node here cannot talk to each other. That's a consequence of this, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this aggregation here. So we ask ourselves, but uh, are those dynamics, are those aggregations, so in the star network it's clear, but in real systems, are those aggregations visible? So the answer is we take some benchmarks benchmarks uh, taken from this, um, from this uh, repository here. And uh, we did an SIS dynamics on top of each of those networks. And then we counted what is the reduced network induced by our aggregation technique. So to how many nodes and edges does the reduced system correspond? 
So you can see that the reduction can be quite drastic in many cases, okay? So if you plot some of those cases, you get something that you cannot understand because it's very difficult to visualize. If you take the Facebook example, you get from something that you cannot understand to a graph which is sparser. And maybe you can understand what is the role of each individual node if it has some kind of tag, if it has some kind of meaning. And that's essentially what we want to, what we want to do. And uh, in, in physics, in the, like in the, in the, um, in the um, area of statistical physics or complex networks, there has been some kind of study about uh, these specific uh, cases. And there is an explanation. And here I'm giving you a possible explanation of why you can see that in network dynamics of this kind. So the explanation, I'm taking a graph, I'm taking this, um, this, this plot here, this figure from this paper here, which the title is kind of a reminiscent of what we are doing today. It's called Exploiting Symmetry in Complex Network Analysis. And the idea is the following. The observation here that probably was not originally made uh, in that paper, but uh, my apologies to the author in case it was not the case, is that essentially real world networks are formed by a backbone, which are the uh, white nodes here, which, is, which doesn't have a clear structure. Attached to this backbone are instead groups of nodes that are symmetric. So what you find in those aggregations is that the aggregation reveals the backbone and removes the symmetric things, which are all compressed into representative nodes. That's why, if this uh, hypothesis is true, that's why you can find uh, sensible aggregations in real-world networks, because they might uh, respect some of this pattern. These are for natural cases, but also for engineered, engineering cases. I think that the, uh, somehow, philosophically here, uh, my personal intuition is that uh, our minds are designed such that uh, we look for symmetry because symmetry simplifies our reasoning about complicated worlds. So when we design uh, a, a, even a, 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 like a, in electrical electronics or electrical engineering, when we design something for redundancy, then we copy pieces of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of our project and we replicate identical pieces because we have a solution for something simpler that can be scaled up to something more complicated. So here I'm giving you three examples of aerial views of cities that where you can really see the symmetry going on there. If you want to plan for a city, it makes sense, like the Romans taught us, to be symmetric because that gives you order and easier, easier reasoning about that. So the, the symmetry that you find in real system, essentially, you can capture or you can discover uh, also automatically um, if you have a model of that. So now here there are some uh, previous findings on computational models in systems biology about what we aggregate in such models. So here is one case uh, of some uh, pathway. Um, published in 2013 where they did a, a theoretical model using formal chemical reaction networks. In that case, I think it was a, a rule-based system and some uh, in vivo experiments to validate that model. And here I'm giving you one explanation, one interpretation of this aggregation. So these are representations of possible molecular complexes. They're all different from each other. And uh, here, is one binding site that can be, sorry, here is a one a binding phosphorylation site that can be phosphorylated or not. These are examples of aggregations of two formal species, different species, that are equal in their configuration up to the phosphorylation state. So if you're interested in the total concentration of a certain configuration, for example, when this ligand, the ligand is formed, but you're not interested in the active state of those, you can put them all together because they, those will give you a single variable for each case. So here you have a single variable, here there are two species with a single variable, here you have three species because you can have 
fully phosphorylated, fully unphosphorylated, and only one phosphorylated, and those will be compressed into a single species. So in that particular case, you go from a model with uh, over 900 species and 11,000 reactions to a model which is much simpler to understand because you can actually read it out on a piece of paper with 87 species and the 700 reactions. And that's the maximal aggregation you can get, probably because of our results. And the similar, there are some other, some other interactions to this case. I think my time is running out, right? Three minutes. So again, here you discover equivalences between these structures that carry over to all the complexes that are equal up to those structures. And again, you can reduce the amount of, uh, of, of variables that you're looking at if you're willing to accept not to distinguish between the concentrations of things that are in that block. So here, I'll give you some benchmarks, essentially. You can be quite aggressive. These are, it is a model, benchmark model designed for symmetries. And we use it as a benchmark to test, in practice, how long it takes to actually reduce. That's an old figure. You can be faster than that. But essentially, a model with over 250,000 reactions can be reduced in just a few seconds because of the, thanks to the polynomial time algorithm that we have. OK, so I think I'm done. I'm done by saying that essentially what we did is develop an, a series of algorithms, a set of algorithms for reducing networks, like reaction networks, with the idea of obtaining exact reductions. So we, don't, we lose information about things that get aggregated because we cannot get it back. But what we preserve is exactly the same as what we had before. Of course, you can, the next step is to think about approximate reductions. We are talking with Tanya. It's, uh, it is a whole scale of new problems here uh, that involve like perturbation analysis and different techniques. We're just scratching the surface here. We have some work but, uh, published last year, but this is what we are really working on at the moment. To reuse the same algorithms, compute some tolerance, and check whether this tolerance, how this tolerance has an effect on the dynamics of systems that, or equations that are not equivalent, but are equivalent up to the tolerance. Another thing is that these models require a perfect knowledge of the parameters, of the rates. Those numbers there must be real numbers that are fixed. Now, there are lots of biologists. Most of I think you're working in a wet lab or so. Maybe you're measuring rates or things, and you know that things are in real life are uncertain, uncertain. You cannot really give it with very good confidence a rate, in particular for biological cases. Maybe in engineering cases, but even there it's very difficult because they are subject to noise and uh, uncertainty, things that cannot be directly uh, measured. So these models work, but they are very abstract, maybe very abstract. And in particular, it's very difficult to understand what is the impact of, the, of, a, cha of a slightly different rate to, with respect to the dynamics, because these systems are nonlinear, the real systems are nonlinear, the models are nonlinear, so the perturbation of a small change in the rate is not easy to predict. So, as I said, it's well known difficulty, especially in natural sciences. So, what we are doing here is essentially redo the same stuff, but for models that have uncertainty as a first class citizen. So, rather than saying we consider a model, this is a Markov chain. We consider a model where we know exactly the rate at which we jump from one state to another state. We say, we don't know that, but it's uncertain. We know lower and upper bounds. Maybe we take them from previous papers or from some guess, but we are more liberal. And the question is, where, if we are more liberal, by allowing uncertain behavior in the model, can we still reduce this uncertain behavior to something that is smaller, still uncertain, but such that the reachable probabilities across all possible uncertainties is somehow preserved. So this is something that we just submitted, so it's very fresh. The answer is yes for Markov chains, and hopefully maybe the answer will be yes also for more complicated like reaction network models. We don't know, but we are actively investigating that. Okay, so I think I'm done. These are some references from which I took all these papers. If you're interested, of course, talk to me and I will provide you further references. Of course, I would like to acknowledge uh, some collaborators. So this work has been done mostly with uh, uh, Luca Cardelli from Oxford University, previously in Microsoft Research, 
and essentially it was a contact that we established during the course of the Quantico project that Stefan was mentioning. And then Max Tchaikovsky and Andrea Van Dien were two of my ex-postdocs, and now uh, associate professor in Oldborg and uh, DTU. And then a number of students, uh, PhD students at MT, including Stefan, who is now here. Um, thank you very much. declare that you want certain species to be like represented? Like I'm just thinking, for example, one of the proteins is poisonous, and so we really care yeah. about that one. Yeah. So is it possible in your algorithm to say this yeah. one is... Yeah. Only that one, and reduce the rest. Yes, yeah. you can do it. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So the examples that you showed, like the SIR model, that's a simple contagion model. How would, uh, could this method generalize, or how would it change if you have something nonlinear, such as a complex contagion or a threshold? Threshold like um, interactions. Okay, thanks. Excellent question. I didn't uh, talk too much about it. So, if you want to have, at least the, that's what we proved so far, if you want to have an algorithm that scales fast, polynomially fast, with respect to the, to the system size, then the underlying differential equations must be polynomial. So, the interactions must be of some kind of mass action type. If you want to have more complicated dynamics, these you can do using another set of algorithms um, that we have developed already, but we have developed, they are implemented even in the tool, but rather than going for a, for a polynomial algorithm, they go for something that is more complicated than that, which is used, using a technology and theory, which is called satisfiability module theory, uh, which essentially can incorporate more complicated uh, types of interactions. For example, Michaelis Menten, or thresholds, or other kinds of, even hard thresholds with the mi minimum and maximum. This you can incorporate, you can hope for the reductions, and we have the technology for that as well. But we don't have the polynomial time guarantees of the algorithm. But we do preserve all the other guarantees, including the fact that you can isolate species that you're interested in, and that you get the maximal aggregation, except that the underlying technology is different. So, uh, not always indicates that there's some sort of a functional, functional module that's being replicated. Can you look at what things get reduced and then identify are these things that were lumped together functional module of some sort, or is that something that you can't extract? Back? So, as I showed you uh, in the in the previous example, yes, we spend a lot of time trying to understand what is the meaning of the of the reduction. So, in this case, for example. We had this model with uh, 500 species, oh, yeah, 471, and we get to 345 blocks, clusters. And then we looked at each of them individually to see what is going on here. And from there, we realized that what was going on was that uh, in order to form these uh, complexes, these dimers here, you need to form this uh, kind of what I'm drawing here as a kind of a bridge, right? So the symmetry is not that uh, these two things are equivalent. The symmetry is that uh, when the complex is endocytosed, these three species that are three different, three different formal variables in the underlying system of equations actually can be put together. So you have a cluster of three species representing that, these, and this that are somehow equivalent. Now, they are not functionally equivalent in this case. Because, uh, of course, this has the capability of, uh, of uh, bind to the ligand, and this does not because it's already bound. So they are different species. Yet, if you don't care about the concentrations of each of those individually, you can look at their total concentration. And if you can look at their total concentration, you can look at the total concentration of all the complexes that are equal up to this difference. So whatever is bound to them doesn't matter, so long as it is the same, and these three complexes differ only for these basic building blocks that are different from each other, but equivalent according to our notions of equivalence. 
and the, similarly for the, uh, for the star networks. We, didn't, we expected that to be a lumping, but we didn't know. So we said, okay, what is going on? We, as an input, we gave this. As an output, we got that. We don't have any notions of graph because we know it's coming from a graph, but we don't, we, it's not written in the algorithm. But then once you read that, you, show, you can see that this is equivalent to a SIS dynamics on a simple graph. So you infer this structure by reading and interpreting manually these reactions. This is something that is, of course, left to the model. You cannot, you cannot make this automatic. But the fact that you have a simple to understand notion of aggregation where you just aggregate sums, in our opinion, makes it easier for us to understand what is going on or what are the functional things that are actually lumped together somehow. That's at least our experience so far. So you had a question? Yeah, it's related to that one. My question was about uh, uncertainty in topology. Yeah, like if you have these graphs, and, but of course you can maybe reduce it also to the uncertainty in the reaction time. Exactly, exactly. If you say that the reaction can vary between zero included and some positive number, you are implicitly saying that that edge may not be present. So you encode the uncertainty in topology. Thank you. Thank you.